Hi there. So here we are, Odd Thomas, Chapter 28. When we left off, <clears throat> Odd and Stormy who were... Actually, Stormy was trying to convince Odd to go to Vegas and get married. And Odd was reassuring her that uh, he would be fine, they would be fine, everything would be fine. Um, although... As a narrator, Odd Thomas was saying that he was a fool to be, to really be so cavalier um, and not really understand, <clears throat> excuse me, understand the danger. Anyway, so here we are, chapter 28. <clears throat> excuse me, just a second, let me take a drink. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, here we go, chapter 28. When we got out of the Mustang, the familiar alleyway dwindled north and south into, into deeper gloom than I recalled from other nights, little revealed by moonlight, obscured by moon shadows. Above the back entrance to the restaurant kitchen, a security lamp glowed, yet the darkness seemed to press toward it rather than shrink away. Uncovered stairs led to a second floor landing and the door to Terry Stanball's apartment. Light shone behind the curtains. At the top of the steps, Stormy pointed at the northern sky. Cassiopeia. Star by star, I identified the points of the constellation. In classic mythology, Cassiopeia was the mother of Andromeda. Andromeda was saved from a sea monster by the hero Perseus, who also slew the Gorgon Medusa. No less than the fabled Andromeda, Stormy Llewellyn, daughter of another Cassi Cassiopeia, is stellar enough to deserve a constellation named for her. I have slain no Gorgons, however, and I am no Perseus. Terry answered the door when I knocked, accepted the car keys, and insisted that we come in for coffee or a nightcap. Light from two candles throbbed pleasantly over the kitchen walls as cool drafts of conditioned air teased the flames. Terry had been sitting at the table when I knocked. A small glass of peach brandy stood on the red and white checkered table oilcloth. As always, the background music of her life was Elvis. This time, wear my ring around your neck. We had known that she would expect us to visit for a while, which is why Stormy hadn't waited at the bottom of the stairs. Terry sometimes suffers from insomnia. Even if sleep slips upon her with ease, the nights are long. When the closed sign is hung on the front door of the grill at 9 o'clock, and after the last customer leaves between 9 and 10, whether Terry is drinking decaf coffee or something stronger, she opens as well a bottle of loneliness. Her husband, Kelsey, her high school sweetheart, has been dead for nine years. His cancer had been relentless, but being a fighter of the uncommon determination, he had taken three years to die. When his malignancy was diagnosed, he swore that he would not leave Terry alone. He possessed the will, but not the power to keep that oath. In his final years, because of the unfailing good humor and the quiet courage with which Kelsey waged his long moral battle, Terry's love and respect for him, always deep, had grown profound. In a way, Kelsey had kept his promise never to leave her. His ghost does not linger around the grill or anywhere else in Pico Mundo. He lives vividly in her recollections, however, and his memory is etched on her soul. After three or four years, her grief had matured into a settled sorrow. I think she has been surprised that even after arriving at an acceptance of her loss, she has had no desire to mend the tear in her heart. The hole that Kelsey left has become more comforting to her than any patch with which she could close it. Her fascination with Elvis, his life and music, began nine years ago, when she was 32, the same year that Kelsey died. The reasons for her intense interest in Presley are numerous. Without a doubt, however, among them is this one. As long as she has an Elvis collection, music, memorabilia, biographical facts, to build and maintain, she has no time to be attracted to a living man and can remain emotionally true to her lost husband. Elvis is the door that she closes in the face of romance. The architecture of his life is her mountain retreat, her high redoubt, her nunnery. Stormy and I sat at the table. Terry subtly steered us away from the fourth chair, the one that Kelsey had always occupied when alive. The subject of our impending wedding came up before we properly settled in our seats, 
With the peach brandy that she poured for us, Terry raised a toast to our enduring happiness. Every autumn, she brews crocks full of peach skins into this elixir, ferments, strains, bottles it. The flavor is irresistible, and the brandy packs a punch, best handled in small glasses. Later, as Stormy and I were finishing our second servings, and as the king was singing Love Me Tender, I told Terry about taking Elvis for a ride in her car. She was thrilled at first, but then saddened to hear that he had wept through our travels. I've seen him cry a few times before, I said. Since his death, he seems emotionally fragile, but this was the worst he's ever been in my experience. Of course, Terry said. There's no mystery why he would be a total mess today of all days. Well, it's a mystery to me, I assured her. It's August 14th. At 3.14 in the morning on August 14th, 1958, his mama died. She was only 46. Gladys, Stormy said. Her name was Gladys, wasn't it? There is movie star fame like that enjoyed by Tom Cruise, rock star fame like that of Mick Jagger, literary fame, political fame, but mere fame has grown into real legend when people of different generations remember your mother's name a quarter of a century after your death and nearly half a century after hers. Elvis was in the service, Terry recalled, August 12th. He flew, home to be to Mem he flew home to Memphis on emergency leave and went to his mother's bedside in the hospital. But the 16th of August is a bad day for him, too. Why? That's when he died, Terry said. Elvis himself, Stormy asked. Yes, August 16th, 1977. I have finished the second peach grip brandy. Terry offered the bottle. I wanted more but didn't need it. I covered my empty glass with my hand and said, Elvis seemed concerned about me. How do you mean, Terry asked. He patted me on the arm like he felt sympathy for me. He had this <clears throat> this melancholy look, as if he was taking pity on me for some reason. This revelation alarmed Stormy. You didn't tell me this. Why didn't you tell me? I shrugged. It doesn't mean anything. It was just Elvis. So if it doesn't mean anything, Terry asked, why did you mention it? It means something to me, Stormy declared. Gladys died on the 14th. Elvis died on the 16th. The 15th smacked between them. That's when this Robertson son of a bitch is going to be gunning for people. Tomorrow. Terry frowned at me. Robertson? Fungus man, the guy I borrowed your car to find. Did you find him? Yeah, he lives in Camp's End. And? The chief and I, um, we're on it. This Robertson is a tox toxic waste mutant out of some psycho movie, Stormy told Terry. He came after us at St. Bart's, and when we gave him the slip, he trashed some of the church. Terry offered Stormy more peach brandy. He's going to go gunning for people, you said? Stormy doesn't drink heavily, but she accepted another round. Your fry cook's recurring dream is finally coming true. Now Terry looked alarmed. The dead bowling alley employees? Plus maybe a lot of people in a movie theater, Stormy said. And then she tossed back her peach brandy in one swallow. Does this also have something to do with Viola's dream, Terry asked me. It's too long a story for now, I told her. It's late. I'm whipped. It has everything to do with your dream, Stormy told Terry. I need some sleep, I pleaded. I'll tell you tomorrow, Terry, after it's all over. When I pushed my chair back, intending to get up, Stormy seized my arm and held me at the table. And now I find out Elvis Presley himself has warned Audie that he's going to die tomorrow. I objected. He did no such thing. He just patted me on the arm, and then later, before he got out of the car, he squeezed my hand. Squeezed your hand, Stormy asked in a tone, implying that such a gesture could be interpreted only as an expression of the darkest foreboding. It's no big deal. All I did was just clasp my right hand in both of his and squeeze it twice. Twice? And he gave me that look again. That look of pity, Stormy demanded. Terry picked up the bottle and offered a pour for Stormy. I put my hand over the glass. We've both had enough. Grabbing my right hand and holding it in both of hers as Elvis had done. Stormy said insistently, What he was trying to tell you, Mr. Macho Psychic Batman Wannabe, is that his mother died on August 14th, and he died on August 16th, and you're going to die on August 15th. The three of you, like a hat trick of death, if you don't watch your ass. That isn't what he was trying to tell me. I disagreed. What? You think he was just hitting on you? He doesn't have a romantic life anymore. He's dead. Anyway, Elvis wasn't gay, Terry said. I didn't claim he was gay. Stormy made the inference. I'd bet the grill, Terry said, and my left butt cheek, that he wasn't gay. I groaned. This is the craziest conversation I have ever had. Terry demurred. 
Give me a break. I've had a hundred conversations with you a lot crazier than this. Me too, Stormy agreed. Odd Thomas, you're a fountain of crazy conversations. A geyser, Terry suggested. It's not me, it's just my life, I reminded them. You better stay out of this, Terry worried. Let Wyatt Porter handle it. I am going to let him handle it. I'm not a cop, you know. I don't pack a gun. All I can do is advise him. Don't even advise him this time, Stormy said. Just this one time, stay out of it. Go to Vegas with me. Now. I wanted to please her. Pleasing her pleases me. And then the birds sing sweeter than usual, and the bees make better honey, and the world is a place of rejoicing, or so it seems from my perspective. What I wanted to do, and the right thing to do, were not one and the same. So I said, the problem is that I was put here for this work, and if I walk away from the job, it will only follow me, one way or another. I picked up my glass. I'd forgotten it was empty. I put it down again. When I've got a specific target, my psychic magnetism works in two directions. I can cruise at random and find who I need to find, in this case Robertson, or he'll be drawn to me if he wants to be, and sometimes even if he doesn't. And in the second case, I have less control and I'm more likely to be unpleasantly surprised. That's just a theory, Stormy said. It's nothing I can prove, but it's true. It's something I know in my gut. I've always figured you don't think with your head, Stormy said, her tone changing from one of insistent and almost angry persuasion to one of resignation and affection. Terry said to me, if I were your mother, I'd box your ears. If you were my mother, I wouldn't be here. These were the two most important women in the world to me. I loved each of them in a different way, and declining to do what they wanted, even in the interest of doing the right thing, was difficult. The candlelight burnished their faces to the same golden glow, and they regarded me with an identical anxiety, as though by virtue of their female intuition, they knew things that I could not perceive, even with my sixth sense. From the CD player, Elvis crooned, Are you lonesome tonight? I consulted my wristwatch. It's August 15th. When I tried to get to my feet, Stormy didn't restrain me as she had done previously. She, too, rose from her chair. I said, Terry, I guess you'll have to cover for me on the first shift or get Pope to come in if he's willing. What, you can't cook and save the world at the same time? Not unless you want the bacon burnt. Sorry to give you such short notice. Terry accompanied us to the door. She hugged Stormy, then me. She boxed one of my ears. You be here day after tomorrow, on time, at the griddle, flipping those cakes, or I'm going to demote you to fountain jockey. That's it. Chapter 28. See you next time.